Uh, so today is our last session in our NIH grant writing workshop. And we're very delighted to have Dr. Robert Milner with us, who is the senior uh, dean for faculty affairs at the Keck School of Medicine of University of Southern California. And Dr. Milner has been very gracious about joining us uh, at this early hour for his being on the West Coast. Uh, so double thanks. But I will also share with you, Dr. Milner is really one of the national leaders in professional education of faculty. And uh, he has a uh, tremendous uh, experience uh, in many academic roles. And he also had a very active research program himself in the field of neuroscience. So the guidance we have planned to share with you today for developing your specific aims is really based on uh, considerable experience. And we appreciate Dr. Milner's time and support of each of you. Okay, I'm going to turn things over to Rob and he'll introduce today's workshop. And thank you, John. Rob, thanks thank for joining us. Thank you, John, for that very kind introduction. Um, Joan is also equally experienced, particularly on study sections and on all aspects. So we bring you, um, I won't say how many decades of experience, but we bring you a lot today. And what we're going to focus on in this last session is writing specific aims and writing them effectively. And really, our text for the day is this. If you're successful at NIH, you've really uh, effectively communicated your ideas, your plans, your science to reviewers in a way that makes them enthusiastic about supporting uh, your research. And that's really our text for today. But we're going to put you to work um, on writing your own proposal. And we're going to, there is, there will be a uh, worksheet in the uh, chat box and and please that you should download and put on your computers and, and use or you can use notes yourself but we're going to put, put put you through um, writing or drafting uh, the specific aims page for you for your next proposal and really the key to com good communication is knowing who your audience is and putting yourself in their place and I think you saw this if you came to one of the earlier sessions. This is the reviewer work. Typically, reviewers work outside normal hours. You know, this poor individual, his family has gone to bed, he's up at night, um, you know, working on, on his proposal. Think about that reviewer. But that audience, you do not know who that audience is. It will be three talented scientists, good reviewers. You do not know who they are. You can play the game when you get your study, your summary statement back and try to figure out who it was, who were, were your reviewers, but you'll never know that. And there's no guarantee that those reviewers are going to be the world's expert in your particular area of science. They're gonna be knowledgeable, experienced, but maybe not um, quite attuned uh, to what you're proposing. So it's important to keep that in mind. It's important to think about the audience for your proposal. This is not a Pulitzer Prize winning novel. This is something you'll spend months writing that essentially is read in detail by three people. And what you wanna do is to make sure that those three people are enthusiastic about your proposal. And think about how do you want your reviewers to react to your proposal? Think about your audience, because your goal is to excite and persuade them. Do you want to confuse them? I don't really understand the logic of this proposal. Do you want to put them to sleep? Uh, this poor man is already half asleep. Uh, it's late at night. It's one o'clock in the morning. Do you want to make them angry? You know, ah, oh, keep seeing these typos. Ah, oh, just. You know, if I, I hope the, the applicant is more careful in his science or her science than they are in writing uh, their proposal. What you want is this, ah, Eureka. I wish I had thought of these ideas. I wish I had wrote this. This is re a really good project. I'm excited by it. 
That's the reaction you want to provoke in your in your review. Think about that as you sit down to write your proposal. The first thing is to think about writing a grant is not like writing a paper. We all write papers and we all write grants, but they're entirely different processes. So a paper looks backwards. It describes what you done, what you've done. It comes to conclusions that are supported by data, by rigorous analysis. We're never always quite sure. So it's often the tone is nuanced, equivocal. Yes, but. Writing a grant is the opposite. As grants look forward, they describe what you're going to do. They describe the outcomes that will happen if what you do is successful, if your plans are successful. And those outcomes are supported by feasibility and competence, preliminary data, your ability to do the work. So the tone should be confident, direct. We like to say there is no hope in writing a grant. Don't say, we hope to do this. You say, we will do this. And if our hypothesis is correct, this is what we expect to find. And this will be the outcome. Make it direct and confident. Obviously, you can't oversell it, but it's important to have that confident tone. Because if you're not confident that your science is going to work, how do you expect your reviewers uh, to be confident? And there's several key elements to writing a successful proposal. As we talked about yesterday, it must have a high likelihood of producing results that will have an impact. So you've got to emphasize the significance, the innovation. What is new about this? If I do this, what will, what will we know? Think of that poor reviewer. It must be easy to understand. So it should be simple, concise, logical. Sometimes less is more in writing a proposal. You must know what's required. Read the instructions, make sure you have everything in the right places. And you must know how it's going to be reviewed. Remember those review criteria, whether they're criteria for an R series or a K or an F. Remember, look at the criteria. You want to get ones and twos in each of those categories. So write to the review criteria. And you must start with a research question that's important, significant and in, in having significance and impact. It should address an important problem, a gap in scientific knowledge or an unmet treatment. And think about the goal, if we achieve what we wanna do, if we do the experiments and get those outcomes, how will it advance scientific knowledge or improve clinical practice? As NIH defines, it should devote, it should exert a sustained, powerful influence on the research field. That's a direct quote from NIH that describes high impact uh, proposals. This is a former mentor of mine, Floyd Bloom, one of the leaders of, of, the, of neuropharmacology. And Floyd would do this wonderful thing when I'd bring him data. He'd look at it and then he'd look up at me and say, now you know that, what do you know? And that's a really important question. That's the so what question. Now you know that new piece of knowledge, how does it advance our field? How does it advance our treatment of patients? Think about that. Does your proposal, does your research question pass that test? It also has to be logical and it must tell a coherent story. So you start with that research question that's founded on a testable hypothesis that will lead to experimental conditions, predictions. And those predictions will give you defined outcomes. That's the logic of a proposal. And those defined outcomes must then advance the research question. But don't expect the reviewer to figure this out from your writing. You've got to tell him or her each of these. What is the research question? What is my hypothesis? If that hypothesis is right, it should lead to certain experimental results. 
and defined outcomes, and particularly define the outcomes, because that's the take home. That's what NIH is paying you for. That's what they want to support you is those are those outcomes. Understand the instructions and write to the review criteria. We've talked a lot about this. We've talked a lot about the criteria and you want to get ones and twos in each of these categories, whether it's for a K or an F or, a, or an R. And it should tell a good story. The power of narrative is really important for humans. We like stories. We can follow stories. And compare these two. You know, here is a, a very academic paper on T-Rex. You know, we can read this, but it doesn't really capture our imagination in the same way that a good movie captures our imagination about dinosaurs. And that may seem trivial, but think about it. Tell a good story because you obviously want to convince those reviewers with your evidence, but you also want to excite them with your narrative. And particularly for career development and fellowship awards, the narrative is really important because the narrative is your story. It's about your journey in science. And narratives in the simplest format have three parts. There's the setup, sometimes the exposition. And that in our field would be the problem or question. This is, you know, once upon a time in a land far away, there was a fairy princess. And then there's stuff with the apple and the wicked aunt and all of that stuff. That's the setup, okay? Then there's the conflict or action. And for us, that's how you will solve the problem. That's what you're planning to do. You know, then there was the poisoned apple and the fairy princess went to sleep and but then, you know, the prince rode in on the white horse and everybody lived happily ever after. That's the resolution or the outcome. We sometimes talk about this as a PAR statement, which stands for problem, action, result. It's a wonderful framework. It's a wonderful framework for telling a story about a piece of science. What was the problem? What did I do to solve it? And what was the result? And that's a good format for you to think about for your, narr for your narrative of your proposal. And that narrative is first defined in your specific aims page. Avoid what Steven Pinker calls the curse of knowledge. We talked about those reviewers. We talked about them being knowledgeable, but they don't know what you know. Don't assume your reviewers know what you know, know the intimate details of your particular area of science. So Pinker illustrates this with an, a, a, a cartoon from the New Yorker, where a tourist is asking directions from a city cop. In the city cop's head, everything is laid out perfectly. His directions are absolutely correct. But when it's translated to the reviewer's mind or the tourist's mind, it's a jumble. So, you know, you're the applicant. You're the one giving directions. You assume the reviewer knows what you're talking about. Don't make that assumption. Write simply, clearly, and logically. George Orwell said, never use a long word when you can use a short one. If you can cut a word out, cut it out. Never use the passive when you can use the active. You know, there's some debate about that. Break those rules sooner than saying anything totally ridiculous or barbarous. But think about this. You have six pages or 12 pages. You have a, a page limit for what you're going uh, to present to the reviewers. Longer words, words that are unnecessary, take up extra type space. You don't need them. Your message will come across a lot more clearly if you cut out the irrelevant words. Cut out most of the adjectives and adverbs, the wiggle words, a number of, in order to, particularly the excess modifiers. And this comes back to that equivocation that we associate with writing papers that shouldn't be in writing a grant. Avoid redundancies. Be, be a very strict editor. Make sure all your words in your proposal matter. 
The specific aims page is the most important part. It's the, when I pick up a new grant and I look at it, the first page I turn to is the specific aims page because I wanna get an overview. It's a one page overview of what you're proposing. So it's everything that's in the proposal, the goals, objectives, and particularly the outcomes of what you're proposing. It's a great tool to get feedback early on your proposal. And one of the things we strongly recommend when you're writing a new proposal is craft your specific aims page. Don't do anything else. Craft it, make sure you're comfortable with it. And then give it out to colleagues. Give it out to people who are outside your field. Do they understand what you're proposing? Does it make sense? Do the aims uh, link together in an appropriate way? Get that early feedback just from your specific aims page before you commit to writing the rest of the grant. You'll get much more useful feedback from asking people to read a single page early in the stage of writing a grant, then later when you've committed to concrete prose that you're reluctant to change. Obviously you should get feedback later, but get that early feedback and make sure you're on the right track before committing to the rest of the proposal. So, what we, the format for a specific aims page is a sandwich. This is what we like uh, to propose. And think about that narrative, right? So the first paragraph or the first section is the setup. It describes the topic, the goals, the objectives, the hypothesis, rationale, basically everything the reviewer needs to know about what you're proposing. Then you have the aims themselves, you know, numbered, these are the things I am planning to do experimentally. And the narrative, that's the action. And then the last part, the last paragraph is the resolution. This is where you talk about impact, significance, innovation, and particularly the outcomes. The, if these studies are completed, it will lead to X. An unmet, knowledge, an unmet treatment or a gap in, in knowledge. Now, I believe the template for a specific aims, this is the template that we're going to use. And essentially what we've done is deconstructed what NIH says should be in a specific aims page. We've looked at many specific aims pages and we've reduced them to a number of elements. And what we're gonna do over the rest of the session is to guide you through, we're probably not gonna to get to all of these, but guide you through uh, some of these sections where you will write a sentence for each of these elements. When we're done, or when you're done, and you, as I said, we probably won't get through all of these, but take it home, work more on it. What you'll have is a series of sentences that are form the basis of a specific aims page. Then you can combine them into a narrative, polish them, review, polish, ask for feedback, polish again. This way you can be starting with these essential elements. You can be sure that you've then incorporated the necessary pieces into the specific aims page. Now that first paragraph has a lot of weight to carry. It's got to cover, introduce the topic, tell the reviewer what the gap in knowledge on the upmet treatment is, the long-term goal of what you're planning, the specific objectives, what will be addressed in this proposal, your hypothesis or the framework, the evidence for the hypothesis, and kind of a summary of all of that. And you have about a half page, about, you devote about half the specific aims page, roughly 300 words, really to set the stage for the reviewer and excite them. They should be grabbed into, like writing, like when you pick up a novel and you read that first line, you want that reviewer to be sucked into your proposal and be looking forward to reading. And we use famous lines for literature to illustrate that process of sucking the reviewer in and, and getting them excited, grabbing their attention. Consider these famous open lines. Jane Austen in Pride and Prejudice, 
It's a truth universally acknowledged that a single man in possession of a good fortune must be in want of a wife. Now we could argue about that, you know, 200 years later, um, you know, some of the politics of, 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 of that. Why, you know, or he's going back to Orwell in 1984, he started that book. It was a bright cold day in April and the clocks were striking 13. They don't strike 13, right? Not in our world, but in 1984, they do. Why, you wanna read more. And my favorite from Hunter Thompson in Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, we were somewhere around Barstow on the edge of the desert when the drugs began to take hold. <laughs> you know that's gonna be a rocky ride. Um, and then even very simple and kind of a little bit uh, opaque from Toni Morrison and Beloved. 124 was spiteful. What is 124? Is it a house? Is it a person? What is 124? You want to know more. You want your viewer to be sucked in. Compare that with this. It's a very famous piece of purple prose, which is the first line. I'm not going to read it. It's a single run on sentence. And sadly, it actually resembles a lot of first lines of specific Ames pages that I get to read. This is not what you want to have. You want that first crisp opening sentence. So what we're gonna do is to take you through these elements. Hopefully you found the template in the, in the chat and we're gonna guide you through several of these elements. And what we're gonna do is give you some running illustrations, some running examples, and then ask you, we'll give you about three, four minutes to write your own specific aims, um, your own sentence, and put it in the chat. And we'll pick on, we'll take a few of those and, and give you feedback. We probably won't be able to cover all of them. And we'll try and distribute the feedback to uh, different participants. So take a look at these as opening lines. And you can certainly make these better. Infantile respiratory virus, IRV, is a new agent that causes rapid inflammation of the lungs in young children. We wrote this long before COVID, but kind of the parallels are somewhat interesting. Um, you know, think about this, as you've got a new agent, causes rapid inflammation, urgent clinical problem, unknown etiology, unknown pathology. Pancreatic cancer is commonly diagnosed only at an advanced stage. You get a sense there, this is gonna be about diagnosis of an important and deadly cancer where those early biomarkers are lacking. Dysfunction of small vessels of the brain is associated with early cognitive impairment in dementias. Hmm, I didn't realize that it was small vessels of the brain. That's interesting and it's an important problem. And early cognitive impairment, maybe there's a way to step in early uh, to address that uh, clinical problem. So now it's your turn. Uh, please take three or four minutes and draft the first line of your next proposal. Thinking about the audience, thinking about sucking the reviewer in, thinking about making them excited about your proposal. Go for and Rob, it. I've set the timer and I'll try to give everyone 30 second notice when it's time to come back. And hopefully we'll hear the chimes when our time's up. Okay, welcome back. And Rob, I can see some things in the chat room. Mm -hmm. So thank you for folks that are sharing. And again, we'll try to um, take as many examples as we can and keep moving along um, and also try to vary the examples too. So, so please don't take it personally if we can't uh, give you feedback on every uh, sentence, but we'll try. Rob, and, and, you wanna pick one? Please don't take our feedback personally. We're, uh, mm -hmm. This is offered you know, constructively and um, openly yep. and from our experience and reflects you know, our reaction as a reviewer to what you're writing mm -hmm. in terms of clarity and purpose. Mm -hmm. And it's a good way to also 
um, kind of learn from each other's uh, writing and feedback. We'll talk about that more later too. So Rob, you want to pick one to start with and then we can. Uh, sexual assault essay on college campuses in the United States is a significant public health and safety concern being labeled an epidemic by the Obama administration in 2014. Um, I think that's fairly di direct. It, I wouldn't, I think the, the, the last clause I would lose, I don't think that adds much uh, to the sentence, although it and impresses the, um, emphasizes the, the scope of the problem. I think without that last sentence, it's a reasonable first start. It, what you might think about is giving some sense of where the proposal is going. Right. Um, and I would add to that too, the part that this is an epidemic labeled by the Obama administration, that information can go in your significance section. So when you're thinking of the topic sentence, you want to make it clear what your topic is. We understand that uh, sexual assault on college campuses. But what are you hoping to do? You know, begin leading us towards what your research study is going to address. You don't have to tell us the answer, but I can't quite figure out from reading this, are you gonna be studying safety issues? Are you gonna be studying uh, differences in uh, environments at different college campuses? So I would say you've got the, the start, but it needs a little more work. Okay, here we go, uh, Tara. Despite rapid growth of training programs, individuals from historically marginalized groups remain underrepresented uh, in doctoral level research positions in the behavioral sciences. Um, great topic, um, but um, I would turn the sentence around because I'm reading through kind of a history before I get to the real issue. So maybe something like uh, the challenges of ensuring equal access of individuals to doctoral level research positions is pressing for the field of behavioral sciences. And then put the, despite the rapid growth of training programs in the marginalized groups, put that in your significant section. So get to the topic first, because you're gonna hook your reviewer on the first couple words that are in that topic sentence. So it's, it's a great start, in, but I would say turn your sentence around. Okay, here's another one. People like despite this morning. There's another despite. <laughs> That's you, Rob. <laughs> despite the decades of investigation of disease spurred by tobacco products, nicotine derived nitrosamines remain enigmatic in their multi tissue carcinogenic potential. Mm. Yeah, it's a, it's, it's, it's a little complicated sentence. Mm -hmm. uh, well, partly because even though I'm a pharmacologist, I may not be an, an expert in nicotine-derived nitrosamines. So I think you have to make me make sure, and not everyone knows what carcinogenic potential means. So you've got the right words there, but I think you have to craft it a little differently because Remaining enigmatic, I can interpret that 50 ways. Is it the cell signaling process? Is it gender differences? Is it inducing a certain kind of cancer? Uh, you know, is it lung cancer? Um, is it addiction? So that's where to me, think of who's gonna fund this proposal. Is it gonna be the National Institute on Drug Abuse? 
Uh, is it going to be the national NINDS that might be looking at a mechanism? Uh, or are you going in a totally different direction? Maybe you're looking at inhalation toxicity that's going to be funded by NCI. So keep in mind this topic sentence. You, you have to speak to the reviewer who in their back of their mind um, has been asked to review this proposal because they have some expertise. And they're also aware that carcinogenic things typically get funded by NCI. But this doesn't sound, sound to me like an NCI topic yet. I'm not sold. No, that doesn't mean you can't sell me. I, I think it's got to be crisper. Rob, thoughts on that? I mean, I think what Kent is saying is um, we don't know how these carcinogens, we don't know how nitrosamines cause cancer. And we don't know how they cause cancer in different organ systems. So that's the topic sentence. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Good. The, I <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's basically, you know, it kind of boils in, in you know, it's often, you know, we speak and write using different language. <laughs> yeah. And it's sometimes, you know, I find when I'm talking to somebody across the table, you know, asking them, what's this about? In, in your words, what's it about? It's almost like interviewing yourself. What's this about? <laughs> um, so it looks to me this this is about how these nitrosamines cause cancer in multiple tissues. And that seems to be the essence. Mm -hmm. And if you can wrap the sentence around that essence, um, then I think it's it will be much more direct. When we write, we tend to, as I say, equivocate. We add all this other baggage mm -hmm. to our sentences, like the dark and stormy night, that really kind of get in the way of-, um, of The message. Uh, the message, yeah. yeah. Now, here's a- Breast cancer is one of the most common forms of cancer with about 1.3 million new cases and over 46, 465,000 deaths reported each year worldwide. Now, that is, you know, kind of a very standard way of introducing a disease-oriented proposal. When we talk about how common it is, how many new cases there are, how many deaths. That's a very common mechanism. Uh, to use. But it's worth thinking about who the audience is on the review panel. Mm -hmm. Is this, um, no, breast cancer is fairly widespread. It's, it's probably going, you, you can be sure that on any cancer review panel, there are going to be experts in breast cancer. I mean, the Department of Defense has whole programs for devoted to, to breast cancer. For new investigators too. They know what breast cancer is about. They know this stuff. You want, if that's your audience, you want to be able, you want to say something less generic than this. This is going to look like every other breast cancer grant that they're going to read. You want to say something very specific that already alerts the reviewer to you know, what particular specific angle you're going to bring to, to breast cancer. We have no idea where this one is, 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 is going. So think of the audience. Mm -hmm. And Rob, that's really true of the next one, the peripheral artery disease affects approximately 10 million patients in the US. PAD is a common disease caused by narrowed or blocked arteries supplying the legs. This is where, again, this will likely go to Heart, Lung, and Blood, the Institute uh, at NIH. And your reviewers, uh, I think it's good that you introduce the uh, abbreviation of PAD. That's very important. But the stuff that's there isn't enough to tell me where your research study is going to go. So I would start with peripheral or artery disease, PAD, but tell me something uh, so I can have a sense of what's going to be next. And we're going to talk about that in just a few minutes. So uh, 
maybe it is going to be focused on the process by which arteries narrow or blocked. I don't know if you're going to look at nutrition, you're going to look at statins, if you're going to look at thrombinectomy treatment, or if you're coming up with some something totally new. So again, just like the one before, this one's a little generic and you need to kind of get down to what you're going to do in this project. I see this all the time with first drafts of specific aims. Typically, when folks do their draft, they spend the first five, six sentences telling me everything about the disease or you know, what's wrong, what we don't know. All of that can be cut and pasted in the next section of your grant, the specific aims page. The topic sentence has to get right down to what you're going to do. And we'll show you as we begin to discuss this, the second sentence, why sentence one and sentence two are so critical. Rob, do we have time for one more or two? No, I just want to, actually, what I want to do is to address a couple of questions in, in the okay. chat. Let's um, do that first. Good. One is, and then we'll go on to the next sentence. Right. Um, could you please clarify if it's common to cite existing literature in specific aims page? Mm -hmm. This is a great question. This is something we get asked all the time. And you'll, you'll get a diversity of opinion, but I can tell you that our opinion is no. It gets in the way. You have that significant section later in the proposal where you can go into the literature and cite it appropriately. Um, from, from our perspective, we recommend that the specific aims page should be very direct. It shouldn't be cluttered with the nuance of kind of paper writing where we need to quote right. everything. Right. You, can, you can justify the statements you put in the specific aims page later in the proposal. The purpose of the specific aims page is to deliver your message very clearly and concisely. <laughs> uh, yeah, and along with that, putting references in slows the reader down. Yeah, and the reviewer is going oh, to read, read through that one page very quickly. OK, uh, Ron, back up, if you would. Yeah, I know. OK, I'm, the next I'm, sentence for us, um, there we after go. you have your topic, and I'll take you through these three examples. This is sentence number two, and there's a strategy for it. Your challenge is to describe what's the gap in knowledge or unmet need that your proposal will address. Now, why this is so important is this sets your reader up. They understand what your topic is, and then once they hear these sentences, but what we don't know is this, well, then you come along, you have a solution to offer to fill the gap, to address the unmet need, but you have to define it for your reviewer. Now, these are our three examples. Remember the first one was this new virus and our gap sentences, but, the exact mechanism of the pathogenesis of this virus is unknown, therefore providing little guidance for treatment. Notice it's a but sentence, that's fine, okay? Or however, okay? So our prostate cancer, which is the second example, um, the lack of biomarkers for early stage detection challenges the effective treatment of this deadly cancer. So now we understand this, this application is focused on uh, coming up with a new solution, which are biomarkers for this deadly cancer to detect it earlier so it can be more effectively treated. Very simple, you and I haven't read this proposal but if you were the reviewer reading the, the topic in the gap, you would have a good sense of, oh, okay, I'm set, I understand you. And then the third example is our vascular one. Um, vascular damage uh, usually ascribed to accumulation of beta amyloid. However, recent evidence has implicated early changes in the blood-brain barrier 
So this sentence kind of shows you how the gap sentence can give you a little more information, but this is directing you as the reader to, what are these changes in the blood-brain barrier? Now, again, the gap sentence is very strategic because your topic sentence usually takes you through the opening line of your paragraph into the second line. The gap sentence will take you into the second and third line. If you can get your reader that far into your paragraph, they're hooked already because, and we'll talk about the next sentence, you're going to begin orienting them to what you're going to do to fill this gap. And so another way to think about this issue of gap in knowledge is when you're writing a proposal, you're trying to sell to your audience, folks, I need funding because here's this gap in knowledge and I have a solution that's worth testing. Give me the resources I need and I can deliver a potential solution. So, you know, keep thinking of researchers like yourselves being very solution oriented. Um, so we're gonna give you about three minutes and go ahead, I'll start the timer and then we'll put your solutions in the chat room and, uh, you know, think about what's the unmet need that your proposal will address. Welcome back. Um, one comment I was going to make about gap sentences too, Rob, before we get started. Um, for those of you who look at Nature Magazine on a regular basis, um, great examples of topic and gap sentences are to look at the abstracts. Nature Magazine has some of the best editors and writers in the, in the world. And absolutely, their abstracts always tell you in the first sentence what the topic is. But then as you read the abstract, the gap of what the study is going to address is crystal clear. So that's another place to look for some good examples. So Rob, you want to pick one and we'll get started? Um, yeah, sure. Uh, let me try and find one that... Um... We can start backwards. Yeah. Uh, okay. Here's one. Um, there are very few bystander intervention programs explicitly geared towards Greek life and a dearth of information on how these interventions are used to reduce rates of sexual assault in this population. Okay, I'm getting where you're going, um, but I was gonna say this is a long sentence. So I think you can just, instead of saying there are very few programs explicitly, you know, avoid LY words that explicitly, you could just say, we uh, have little information on bystander intervention with Greek life behaviors in college students to develop new effective new interventions to reduce rates of sexual assault, something like that. Chop the words out. What do you think, Rob? Well, this was the one earlier about sexual assault on campuses. Mm -hmm. um, I think the topic for that one could include Greek life. Or, but not everybody knows what Greek life is, too. We know it's a sorority, but folks who are in somebody, you know, may misinterpret that, too. But, you know, but, you know, just saying that there are very few intervention programs geared towards um, fraternities and sororities. Period. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I and mean, I think that that would be totally sufficient on that one. Uh, here's another one. Gait rhythmicity, the bilateral coordination during walking, is overlooked in assessing walking ability of prosthetic users. Um, I, 
I think that's that's reasonable, but maybe the, it should be flipped around with the but. I mean, I love starting sentences with but because it really emphasizes and, and and in terms of the narrative, what you're doing is making a contrast between kind of the topic sentence that introduces kind of the state. Right. But then you bring the reviewer up with the but sentence. I mean, you believe that, but there's a problem. Yeah, and here the but is that we lack information uh, on gait rhythmicity to improve the walking ability of prosthetic users, you know. Yeah, and I would actually um, probably not. You, you, mm -hmm. A rhythmicity of gait or coordination, you know, yeah. use one of those. I think actually mm -hmm. you might turn that around. Right. And say bilateral coordination in walking, in parentheses, gait rhythmicity. Right. Is, is underutilized in, right. uh, in mm -hmm. assessing walking ability of, of prosthetic users. Yeah, great one. That's good. Hey, and don't forget, when Rob says things, folks, write it down, because he really does a great job with these sentences. So, Rob, that was a good one. So here's one. Uh, little is known about underlying muscular changes happening under treatment strategies that could affect the intervention outcomes. Okay. This is a good example where we need more specificity. Uh, I don't so, know. Yeah, we understand that you're trying to look at specific changes with a treatment strategy, but this is where we need a little more specificity. And so try to avoid could affect, that's too wishy-washy, that will impact the plan intervention for what? You know, it needs more specificity, okay? Shorter sentences. Oh, this is the one about peripheral artery disease. Okay. So. Ah, okay. Understand. Okay, good. Uh, let's pick one more. Yep. And then I want to make it. There's one on mentorship, but that's what we did before. Do you want to pick another one? Yeah. Topic sentence. People born with intestinal, so this is a topic, topic sentence. A rare congenital birth defect commonly experienced delays in diagnosis, which can be fatal. Lads procedure is the definitive treatment for intestinal is thought to resolve gastrointestinal gap sentence. The factors are unknown. Yeah, that's a little bit, I think your topic sentence needs to be um, more succinct. Um, mm -hmm. Intestinal malrotation, a common your misdiagnosis or delay in diagnosis of intestinal mal malnutrition can be fatal. Mm -hmm. Although there is a definitive treatment, there is a definitive mechanism, there is a definitive treatment. Mm -hmm. But we don't, we have little knowledge of the outcome of that treatment, mm -hmm. something like that. Or we lack knowledge or evidence. We lack evidence to understand the effectiveness of this treatment. It depends what you're going to do with the study. I mean, um, it looks I'm, like this is an outcomes um, yeah, yeah. study. Yeah. So I'm going to come back to one. Um, it's Carrie's who had the breast cancer. Uh, sentence is good. Little is known about the reasons for lack of breast reconstruction and underrepresented groups. I think you're almost there. You're clearly focusing on um, the question of why underrepresented groups are not uh, choosing to use uh, breast reconstruction. So about the reasons is a little vague. So little is known. 
I like that because it's active. Um, uh, it could even be stronger. We lack information uh, regarding the reasons why uh, the use, utilization of breast reconstruction uh, remains underutilized in whatever groups you're talking about. So I think you're you're getting there. Okay. I just want to make a comment. Somebody um, mm -hmm. commented in the chat mm -hmm. that uh, it was helpful to listen to us critique others. And one of the things I would encourage <laughs> you to do um, is take a look at other people's what other people have, have written and ask yourself. Oh, does that convey, you know, use those as examples. Do I understand what's saying? Would I write it differently? And, and in fact, in the days when we had the joy of doing this, these sessions in person, mm -hmm. what we would do is put you into pairs mm -hmm. and we'd ask you to first write that sentence and then share, exchange and critique each other's. Mm -hmm. And then you're playing kind of reciprocally the role of reviewer. Whenever we read those sentences and think about right. what does it mean, what is it saying, do I understand it? We're playing the role of reviewer. So but Rob, there's also of... another aspect of this that's happening. We're saying the words out loud. And it's a different kind of editing, a different kind of feedback. When you read the sentence out loud and you're we process cognitive verbal information a little different from what we read. And it's a great way to sort of hear, well, that doesn't quite make sense. And likewise, the other thing that's wonderful about writing it down, and I'm looking at uh, Y, which is the, in the spinal cord studies primarily focus on the role of estradiol, no susceptive sensory process and pain sensitivity. I'm looking at that and I'm saying, what words can I cut out? So like the word primarily doesn't need to be there. Um, does everyone understand uh, estradiol, the role of estradiol? Well, why is that important? Um, what's pain sensitivity? Um, and I understand scientifically where you're going, because I know a lot about spinal cord function and steroid hormones, uh, nervous system function, because that's in my background. But you have a great concept here, but it's not precise enough yet, okay? And so where you say less is known about neuromodulatory effects on spinal cord circuits, you're getting there, but you still haven't hooked me on why do I need to better understand what your gap is? And so, for example, this is an example of one where I need to understand why the sensory processes and pain sensitivity is a challenge. So I would work on your topic sentence a little bit more because you have a complicated You've got complicated things like spinal, you know, circuitry in the, in the spinal cord, um, which isn't just motor circuits, uh, pain sensitivity, sensory processes, nociception. So I think um, why this is important to the field of neuroscience for treating spinal cord injury, you know, something. You know, and again, think of who your funder is. It's likely to be NINDS, the Neurological Institute. So, but Rob, back to what you just said, getting feedback, working with someone uh, in a writing group is a wonderful way to get this kind of feedback. And you have to kind of focus sentence by sentence to think about the logic. Yeah, no, that's really critical. Well, but everyone, thank you for sharing too. and. We'll try to get as, to as many as we can today, but there's 66 of you on the call, so, okay. 
Okay, I'm going to take you through now mm -hmm. the next two sentences together. Mm -hmm. Right. So we've introduced the topic of the proposal. We've stated what the gap in knowledge or the unmet need is. Hopefully we've excited the reviewer. They want to read on. Now you have to put it in context of you. You know, you've stated the problem. Now you have to bring it down to what you're going to do. And that's the that's the, the job of the next two sentences. So the first, the third sentence, the first one of those two, is to describe the kind of the, the context, the long-term goal of your research, who you are and what do you do. So the long-term goal of our lab is to understand the biologic biology of infectious agents to provide a foundation for effective therapies. Our lab focuses on microRNAs, MERS in the detection and treatment of cancers. Our goal is to study the function and dysfunction of the blood-brain barrier in dementias. We got a pretty good idea of the competence, the expertise, what you're bringing to that important question. Sorry, my screen is jumping around. Um, and then you take it down to the specific proposal. And this is not the specific aims of the proposal. This is the objectives. This is what we're going to attack. This proposal will define the mechanism of virus binding to its host cells in order to understand the pathogenesis of IOV. The goal of this proposal is to develop biomarkers for the early detection of pancreatic cancer by investigating the expression of MERS. In this proposal, I will investigate the action of a novel factor, AFF1, secreted by astrocytes on the blood-brain barrier. So see what we have, An another model um, for a specific AIMS page, particularly the starting point is a funnel. So see how we've, we've taken the topic sentence, stated what the gap is, what the problem is, we've described our, what we do, and now we describe what this proposal will do. So in four sentences, you've taken the reviewer from the general statement now to specifically what this proposal will address. So in four sentences, they should know what this is about. And, and Rob, the sentence before the objectives, where you if you can just back up for a second, I want to show something. Thank you. If you're writing a fellowship application, an F award, or a career development award, it's absolutely essential that you remind the reader that your long-term goal is to do research in the topic of X, Y, Z, and to become an independent investigator. So you set the stage for your, your K award or your F award and then when you go to the next slide, which is the objectives of this pro project, you funnel the reader down, you remind them, ah, Rob's going for a K. And this is what he's gonna do during the K. And keep in mind, we haven't put the hypothesis in yet, but Rob, like you said, four sentences in, you've got the reader hooked. They know who you are, they know you're excited about this topic. And now they're getting curious, well, how are you gonna do this? Right. And again, the one thing about scientific investigators, reviewers, whether they're clinicians or basic scientists, we're all curious. So at this point, if you get them to your objectives, first of all, they're not making up their own objectives because we're all creative. We all can come up with ideas of what your project should be. Your job is to tell the reviewer, this is what this project is doing. And that's what the reviewer has to evaluate, not what they think you should be doing, but what you're proposing on paper. Okay. So there's, a, there's an important question um, and mm -hmm. a very relevant one in the chat from Ronald. Mm -hmm. Can you please further describe, differentiate objectives versus, versus specific aims? So, what we're talking about in terms of objectives is a one sentence summary of what the proposal is about. And it's really, you know, the contrast between 
the third sentence, the, the long-term goal, and the fourth sentence, the objectives, is, you know, this is our big picture. This is what we do. And this proposal is that, it's this specific part of that problem that we're going to address here. Right. Your specific aims are then kind of experimentally, how are you going to do that? We're going to do it by A, this, B, this, C, this. And that sums up into this general objective. Okay. It's a one sentence summary of right. what you're planning to do. In and so for example, for an art grant, your big picture is my laboratory or my research program is investigating chronic kidney disease uh, uh, in surgical patients. In this project, we are focused on this question. And that's the key. The more focused your proposal is on one question, and that's that objective, uh, the, the, the more successful your proposal is going to be. And then your aims are specifically the steps that you're going to use to accomplish that right. objective. Right. It's that simple and that difficult. And this is sentence number four. So it's, it's really interesting. Okay. Okay. So we're going to give you um, a few minutes to yep. write. I'll the, set the clock. The pair of sentences, your long-term goal or the long-term goal of your lab. And then specifically what this proposal is, attending, is intended to achieve. Mm -hmm. Okay, welcome back and please put your uh, examples in the chat room if you feel comfortable. Here we go. Um, one comment too, uh, don't forget if you're doing a fellowship award or a K award, this is the one time you don't have to say our team. You can say, I, my long-term goal, okay? So just keep that in mind. Rob, do you wanna pick an example? Yeah, these are the ones I'm seeing so far are all excellent. I mean, they're very crisp. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Katerina, long-term goal is to develop effective bystander intervention programs. In this proposal, I will describe how existing bystanders are addressing sexual assault among, excellent, excellent. Mm -hmm. Very mm -hmm. clear, direct. Um, my long-term goal is to make early intervention for cerebral palsy widely accessible, especially to underrepresented populations. I will investigate the efficacy, efficacy of a new reliable infant crawling. Just to, yeah, that's, these are great. A long-term goal is to increase the representation of individuals from historically marginalized groups, behavioral sciences. This proposal will establish and evaluate the preliminary, preliminary efficacy of the science academic mentorship network. Right. We know exactly what you're doing with these. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, as a reviewer, know from that fourth sentence, exactly what, um, what this proposal is about. And the long term goal of our research is to improve outcomes in breast reconstruction. In this proposal, we will, out, we will evaluate outcomes specifically in underrepresented minority groups. So, on that one, I think it's excellent, but just even wordsmith, you can just say for the second sentence this proposal will evaluate outcomes from underrepresented minority groups. And you might even specify what those minority groups are, yeah, you know, you, including, you know. It's a good case you don't need the adverb. You don't like, need a Y word. Right, you, and even in, just more direct, doing. this yeah. proposal will. And see how we're using that direct, confident tone. It's not this proposal aims, or we hope this proposal will uncover. It will. It's, and you're all doing this really lovely. So thank you. Actually, the, the next one from mm -hmm. the long-term goal to identify cognitive communication interventions for community older adults with acquired, that's great. Um, but this proposal aims to, this proposal mm -hmm. will test mm -hmm. 
See the contrast? And uh, not through bonding, but using or by inter intergeneralization bonding. I can't even say it, my apologies. As maybe even turn this around. This proposal will test a cognitive communication intervention. You know, think, think of which way this needs to go, right? Because I'm not sure. Intergeneration bonding. I have so much to learn. That's what's fun about this for us because we get to learn new things. Okay, the long-term goal is to develop an effective, low-cost intervention that enhances gait, rhythmicity, walking proficiency, and ultimately improves employment retention rates in individuals unilateral lower limb amputation. Woo, you know what? That's, that's a little over ambitious, okay? Because the ultimately improves, improves employment retention rates is likely beyond what this study is gonna be doing. It's the outcome from your intervention that may help to improve employment retention rates. Unless you're studying employment retention rates, don't put that in that sense, okay? But the objective of this proposal is to determine the relationship between gait rhythmicity and work-related walking demands in people with lower limb loss. That's great. Okay, so I would clean up the sentence above, make it a little more generic. Okay, or you could say, uh, my long-term career goal is to improve the integration of individuals with disabilities, specifically improving their uh, ability to function on a effectively in their daily lives and at work. Okay, and that sounds more like a long-term goal, okay? So, and again, you don't wanna overuse the key things you're doing um, over and over. You wanna say things a little differently between these sentences, but I think this one, work-related walking demands in individual, people, individuals with lower limb loss is very clear. Great. Rob, Excellent. one more or two more? No, I think, I think we'll, we'll move on because I think yep. they've got this, this, this one. Yeah. In just three tries. I agree. Good for you. Everyone's doing a great job. Yeah. I think, mean, you know, and, and, you know, look at other people's and, you know, mm -hmm. you'll get a sense of, yeah, if I was reading this, I would know what this proposal is about. Right. It's not a mystery. I know exactly what it's about. Right. Now, in the interest of time, because we want to get to, particularly to the last paragraph quickly, <laughs> I'm going to skate through a number of um, the, the elements and apologize for this. But I think you get the principle of the, we're illustrating a couple of principles here. One is defining these elements, taking it one step at a time, creating that one sentence that that fits that particular uh, element. Getting feedback on your language, thinking about your audience. Would this make sense to me? And, and give it to somebody who's not in your field. And, and John and I are obviously not in many of your fields. And <laughs> yes. you know, we're looking at it as a as a educated reviewer would look. Mm -hmm. at it. Mm -hmm. um, and, and learn from others. But I want to get through some of the next um, sections. So you've now established what the proposal is about. The next thing you want to get give the reviewer a sense that there's some logic behind this, that there's a hypothesis, and there's some evidence for the hypothesis. So the fifth sentence, the next sentence that you do, and we're not going to ask you to do this, but this is your homework, work through these. Um, is to define your hypothesis. We will test the hypothesis that IRV initiates infection by binding, blah, blah, blah. Our hypothesis is that tumor genesis changes the expression of MERS. We hypothesize that inflammation of astrocytes, blah, 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 blah. That's our underlying framework that we're studying. Then you wanna give the reviewer a flavor 
of the evidence supporting that hypothesis. Not in great detail, but you know, maybe one of the most important pieces of evidence that you have to support that. And if that's from your own preliminary data, all the better, because that demonstrates that you've done, the, you started to do the experiments, you have the competence. Preliminary studies have shown that we have shown that tumors are increased in expression compared to normal tissue. AFF1 was identified in a screen um, in astrocytes following inflammation. Knockout mice showed a decrease in blood brain barrier. So, a little bit of preliminary data supporting the evidence. The reviewer can go on with confidence saying, yeah, so far all of this makes sense. It all fits together. And then you just want to summarize that first paragraph. Very simple sentence. The expertise of our lab on adenoviruses will be applied to the pathogenesis of a novel virus. That's what this is all about. It's a little different from the objective sentence. And maybe the sentence is not quite as necessary, but it's, it's always good to kind of wrap up that first that first paragraph. Yeah, and Rob, in this last sort of end of the first paragraph, they should sort of know what kind of model you're going to be doing. So if it's an animal model, if it's an in vitro model, uh, if it's a clinical trial or a survey instrument, the stage is set for what's next. Okay. And now, we get to the aims themselves. Mm -hmm. So we've spent the last 90 minutes really <laughs> last hour talking about just that first paragraph. Yeah. See how key that is. Mm -hmm. See how key that is to setting the stage. Now, thinking about your aims, and this is why it's important to craft that specific aims page and give it for people to review. Because one of the things that they can give you feedback on, does this make sense in terms of the aims? Are the aims logical? Are they in the right order? Are they contingent, the fatal flaw? So first make sure that you're fitting the aims to the effort. Uh, for a K99 or a K award, it's one person's effort, you, maybe not even 100% of you, over five years. Uh, that might be through two to three aims. And as we described when we talked about the K99 R00, you might wanna divide them by, uh, relate them to the specific phase. If you're submitting an R01 that might have, you know, 3.5 um, FTEs uh, associated with it for over five years, you can do that much more. So the aims can be more extensive, but make sure that you're not over ambitious. You don't try to propose more than you can do, more than the effort allocated. And you need to think about the timeline and you need to avoid contingent aims where subsequent aims are based absolutely on a specific outcome from an earlier aim. Don't do that. They can be, subsequent aims can be related to the first aim in terms of outcomes, but they shouldn't be, first aim shouldn't be, I'm gonna produce this reagent and then use it. In writing the aims, it's useful just to have a sentence that describes what that aim is going to do to characterize the regions of the IRV knob protein necessary for binding to the host cell, to develop monoclonal antibodies. So you can get a sense of what that's about. And that's when you see, we'll flip through these quickly and you'll see them uh, when you get the, the PDFs. Characterize the release of AFF1, determine the action of AFA1 in astrocyte capillary co-cultures. And then you might, with that kind of overview, that kind of sentence that describes it, you might want to add a little bit more detail. It's often done. If you look at examples of AIMS pages, remember yesterday we, we directed you to the NIAID website, which has samples of grant of, of proposals. Look at those and see kind of the variation of how people do it. One technique is to refer to your hypothesis, you know, and, and the prediction from that hypothesis. Our hypothesis predicts that alteration will decrease binding. We will test this by A, B. That's all you need to, to say. In fact, this is probably more than you need to say. Well, Just need 
I would even say, Rob, you could if you had room. Add a third sentence and confirm what the outcome of these experiments will be. Yeah. Because these experiments will define the critical regions uh, we need to know about for developing a COVID-19 vaccine. You know, translating. Um, oh, can you go through the checklist? It's well, I, I'm, I'll come back to that. Okay, good. good. That slide for some reasons out of yep. place. Yep. Um, now we come to the last paragraph, mm -hmm. innovation, impact, and outcomes. And let me just check the time to see how. Yeah, and many times I will share with you when I see first drafts of specific aims, I see the opening paragraph and I see three aims and it stops. And the, what's missing is this very important last paragraph. So it's essential that you close your story. You know, you've got that setup, you've got the aims, which are the action, but you need the results. And so again, think of the PAR statement, that sandwich. So the, this is what we're talking about is that results section. This is the paragraph that closes the deal, mm -hmm. knocks the proposal out of the ballpark. Yep. And you need to, to focus on three elements, innovation, impact, and outcomes, and particularly outcomes. Do we have time to do two here, John, do you think? I think so. Well, let's, let's think yeah. about in, in innovation. We'll do this quickly. Right. So IRV is a new virus. These studies are the first attempt to define the mechanism of its infection. Mm -hmm novel now what is novel we challenged you yesterday to when you're thinking about innovation this proposal is novel because and that's the sentence that you place here yeah this proposal applies a novel approach mris mrrnas as biomarkers to the diagnosis of pancreatic cancer this proposal is the first investigation of a new factor mediating vascular damage in the nervous system now, when you're claiming innovation, you need to be a little bit careful, mm -hmm. particularly when that first one, when you say these studies are the first attempt, you know, there may be three reviewers on your panel that have already tried this or already <laughs> doing this. So you may not be the first. It's better to kind of the novel approach, um, unless you're absolutely confident that this is a first investigation. In the third one, you are confident because you discovered that factor. Mm -hmm and you're taking it to the next step. Right. Okay. So I'm going two and a half minutes, right? Yeah, let's take a few minutes and two and a half and uh, write that innovation sentence. Mm -hmm. Welcome back. I see another good examples coming in. Excellent. It's fun to see what you're doing. And I think you're all getting the sense of how uh, communicating this innovation is really important. Lovely. I'm really enjoying reading these. So, Rob, any comments? That is the first clinical trial to test the efficacy of intergenerational bonding in the interventions. Yeah, perfect. Mm -hmm. um, First attempt to detect the leg crawling motions of an infant by using widely available gyroscopic sensors. Great. Um, yeah, I was going to say the one on the innovation of this study is twofold. Don't waste time on that. Just really focus on, uh, you know, what's innovative. Take out the extra words because what's going to happen by the time you're in at the end of this one page. And remember, your margins are 0 0.5 inches on all four sides, and your font size has to be 11 points, single space. You're not going to have room for extra words. OK, so Rob, you want to go on to the next one? Uh, to the next element? Oh, yeah. the next. Mm -hmm. uh, next element. OK, so we'll, we'll go on to outcomes, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. OK. And I think it's important that this paragraph also, um, if you're doing a fellowship award or a K award, 
that you mention this, or if you're doing a pilot R, R03, or an exploratory R21, you can mention that the outcome of these, these studies will provide a foundation for your becoming an independent investigator or for a larger clinical trial in the future. So keep that in mind. Yeah. Uh, let's see, these, mm -hmm. uh, these studies, I'm missing word, will define the mechanism of IRV infection and provide a foundation for immune therapy. Mm -hmm. Development of biomarkers for early detection will result in a dramatic improvement in the survival rate of pancreatic cancer. These studies will provide new approaches for the diagnosis and treatment of dementias. Okay, now it's uh, back to you. Mm -hmm. Think about that last sentence. And this would be the last sentence of, of the whole specific aims. And so it's the closer, it wraps it up. And this is what the money is, the taxpayer's money is buying. This but app. I would also say though, if you're doing a K or an F, uh, do maybe add a, a third closing sentence or less closing sentence, reminding them that this is a fellowship or K application. Okay. Yeah, I mean, these studies will define the mechanism of IRV infection provided and provide the vehicle for learning my transition from, um, you know, postdoc to independent scientists or provide the foundation for, for future independent research, you know, stuff like that. Okay, now take your turn, uh, write that sentence that kind of wraps your specific aims up, the outcome sentence. And remember, notice all of these are focused on human health. Remember, it's the National Institutes of Health. That outcome should focus on human health, even if it's the most basic science related study, it should still come back to the goal of NIH in improving human health. Yeah, and maybe your funding agency within NIH too. Okay, welcome back. I uh, see a few things coming in and uh, looks good. Uh, the first one, the results of this project will provide new insights on the role of the arm swing during walking in individuals with unilateral lower limb amputation and development of target interventions. You know what? I would say you can wordsmith a little and just say this project. You don't even need to say the results of. But I still think you need a stronger closing sentence that speaks to who's funding you. For example, is the VA system funding your research? Uh, is this being funded by NICCHD? You, know, you have to speak to your funder and your field. So here's where you're kind of also speaking to your peers who are likely your reviewers who are also, uh, I don't know if you're a physical therapist or, or a clinician of a different kind, but this needs to be less detailed and more uh, kind of a little more aspirational. Uh, maybe that's not the right word. Rob, you know what I'm trying to say? Yeah, I think this one could be a, a, a little simplified. Um, something along um, understanding the role of arm swing during walking in individuals will, uh, will lay the foundation for development of targeted interventions. Right, to improve the, the lives of individuals with disabilities. Okay, something like that. Okay, and hopefully you can scan through the rest of them. Uh, no, I, Is your thing not behaving for your own? Yeah, why don't you? Let's see. Want me to share my screen? I can. If we no, need. no, I can. I can do it. Let me just go, okay. go back. Um, this study 
will define attitudes towards breast reconstruction in Black and Hispanic women. Um, I would, yeah, I think you have to make it stronger. This is a, a unique, um, this will provide much needed information that defines the attitudes towards breast reconstruction. With this information, uh, we will then be able to move forward with improving or reducing the barriers to including this underserved population with uh, breast reconstruction, okay? Or treatment of uh, breast cancer disease, something like that, okay? Um, the results of the study will add to our understanding of the impact of these interventions and aid in developing a more targeted program to reduce. I think you can simplify that. Mm -hmm. um, these studies will. Yeah, the, these studies will aid, um, will lead to development. I mean, you could kind of, you, you almost don't need the first part of it. You, right. The home is the second part of that sentence. Right. I would simplify that. Right. Um, will result to developing more well, targeted well, programs that if, will reduce, okay? This uh, um, yeah. pressing, you know. I, I think that's, I mean, I yeah. think that's, I think just going, yeah. <laughs> the results of these, the, the study will enable us to develop more targeted programs. Uh -huh. Just kind of take out that first part. Uh, the outcome of this study will provide accessible and cost-effective interventions to promote cognitive, that's perfect. I love it. Uh -huh. Very direct. Uh -huh. Better understanding the neural ontogeny of these disorders will allow for earlier treatments in clinical practice. Period. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Uh -huh. Because the part about targeting neural dysfunction underlying, underlying early symptomology should go actually up in your first sentence because that's innovative. The fact that your study, this study has targeted neural dysfunction, which underlies early symptomology, an area that has been understudied to date by better understanding the neural ontogeny of these neurological disorders, we will be prepared to provide earlier treatments in the clinical neurological setting. Okay, so. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Are you okay? Can you go back to your slide, couple of slides back around, or did you move it? No, I'm fine, I'm fine. Uh, this study will improve knowledge acquisition opportunities for seniors with learning disabilities through effective human narration. It's a little jargony. <laughs> um, it's kind of like, it, there's a lot of stuff going on there. I think you can simplify it. Yeah. Um, this study will enable seniors with learning disabilities uh, to effectively use uh, assistive technology tools. You know, I think that one, you could sell it differently. And it's selling is the right word. By enabling seniors to better use blah, 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 we will be uh, delivering um, innovations that Im will uh, improve their quality of life and long-term, uh, you know, something like that, okay? Um, Tara's right. already, already under understanding, uh, you know, our, our commitment to being direct. She says, uh -huh. this project will <clears throat> contribute to our understanding of culturally responsive mentoring practices and increase the pipeline of diverse behavioral researchers. And then ask is, will contribute? Yes, will contribute is, is to, is too weak. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. 
I, like, yeah, by, I would say, by understanding the impact of culturally responsive practice, uh, mentorship practice, yeah, I, we will be prepared to better expand uh, the, uh, the, I hate to say pipeline, but that gets overused a little bit. Yeah. To uh, ensure the, somehow make the field more attractive to a diverse array or maybe meet the needs of expanding the biomedical behavioral workforce, something like something that. Something like that. And I would start it with, I won't say this project will contribute to, I would start with understanding culturally responsive mentoring practices will increase the pipeline mm -hmm. or will increase, will have that outcome. So Rob, no, I got it brilliant today. So thank you. Okay. Usually Rob gets the brilliance, so thank I'm you. Not always. It's it's still <laughs> anyway. not eight o'clock in the morning. My my brain is not on full. Yeah, well, your brain's doing a great job. Um, and the, this is nice. Leden is um, offering a tip. You know, yeah. Um, say promotes the use of older adult rather than senior. Great, yeah. great. Mm -hmm. um, That's great that you're providing peer to peer feedback, and I can't tell you enough how having a group or one or two individuals to form a group to write together and get this feedback makes, first of all, it makes the writing process fun. You can see how Rob and I really enjoy this. I hope you can see this. But two, it helps you with finding the right words to reach your audience. And again, we're doing a combination of looking at our written words and then also saying them out loud. And I'm, I'm just assuming all of you regularly teach, whether it's your students or your patients, you're very good at verbally describing uh, how something works to others. And it's almost like standing up and giving a seminar. Your logic has to be very clear so your audience can follow your story. But the challenge with the specific aims, it's one page. And that's the hard part. And I'll share with you, and Rob knows this, my former chair when I was at the University of Pittsburgh, when he teaches grant writing, he will show 18 or 19 different versions of his specific aims page. And there's a reason he has a fabulous track record it's because he works on the specific words so that every word counts on that one page. And it's that simple, but it's that challenging. So yeah. Rob, uh, we got a few closing things. And yeah. Uh, yeah, I think we've uh, hit that. Never, and if anybody has any questions, I'm going to. You want to go back to that NIH? Uh, yeah, this, there this we go. Slide I nice think this is on. really good. Yeah. yeah. So this is, again, taken from the NIAID grants tutorials, the link below. And it suggests some checkpoints. Now, once you've kind of crafted your AIMS page, and as we suggest, you know, take what you've done this morning. I mean, you've already made some progress. Yeah, you've got a rough drive. On paper that, you know, you can use. You're avoiding procrastination too. <laughs> the parts that we didn't cover. Um, you know, and then weave those sentences into a narrative. You don't necessarily have to use one sentence for each. You may need more explanation. It may work better, but, but weave it into a narrative and polish it. And, and then use these checkpoints. And you know, this emphasizes what we've already talked about. My reviewers would see my aims as tackling an important problem in a significant field. That's what we started out with. You've got to have a good research question. It's got to be important. And also how we ended up um, with that outcomes, the impact sentence. So it wraps it round. You start off with the, the topic and the problem and your last sentence should wrap back up to that 
um, to that problem sentence, that gap sentence. It should be addressing that gap sentence directly because that's what the reviewer expects. Uh, the reviewers would view my aims as being innovative, but not too innovative. And this is an interesting concept. And the, the website has a whole uh, piece, I believe, on kind of being cutting edge, but not too far out beyond the cutting edge. You don't want to be too far out that it's going to be considered speculative, particularly if you're a starting investigator, um, where you can't really take major risks. But it should push the field, but not be so far out in front that people are going to say, wow, that's, that's really going, um, uh, that's taking a big jump. My specific aims can test my hypothesis. It's got to be hypothesis driven. NIH, is, it's very mechanistic. It's based on hypotheses and hypotheses are statements that general statements about how things work. Don't confuse a hypothesis with the experimental prediction. A hypothesis should be independent of your experiments. You set the hypothesis, then you, and from that hypothesis, you predict if I do this experiment, I will have this outcome. So make sure you separate your hypothesis from the experimental predictions that you're going to learn by, by through your specific aims. Um, don't, and the hypothesis isn't, I'm going to do this and I will find out this. That's not a hypothesis. The aims are doable within the grant period I'm requesting. And we talked about scope, making sure that what you're proposing fits with the effort that you're requesting. I remember reading a proposal once that was using you know, primary mouse brain cultures and actually did the calculation that you know, there were so many time points and so many different conditions and, you know, needed, you know, to do it in triplicate. Um, and you did the math and it was, I think, something like a hundred, it would take probably a hundred thousand mice to do the experiments. And you realize that the applicant simply hadn't thought through what they were proposing in terms of the scope. The aims and hypotheses or hypotheses are concrete and well-focused. It should be focused. That's the point of that objective sentence. It bites off a piece of your larger goal to focus on. It should be focused. It should deal with one, two, three aims. And don't try to propose more than you can do. That's called being ambitious. Being over ambitious is a bad thing. If you get that back in a, um, you know, summary statement, that's not going to be good. That means you're proposing to do much more than you can handle. And NIH does not like that. And lastly, I can define endpoints. My peer reviewers will be able to, to assess. That's the outcomes. That's knowing um, what you're going to, uh, proposing what you're going to learn from doing the experiments. So make sure you meet those, uh, those checkpoints. These are all very useful tests of the feasibility of what you're proposing. And to wrap up, you know, you know, we can't emphasize enough. Do this before you do anything else. Write your specific aims. I can't write a grant or I can't write a proposal until it's gelled in my head in terms of what it, what I'm going to do. So make sure you, you, you use the aims to sort out the logic of your proposal, make sure you have the right number, that they're not independent, uh, that they're feasible, they fit within the scope, and then stop there and get feedback. Farm it out, send it to 10 colleagues, send it particularly to people outside your field, get their feedback. Does this make sense? Am I out in left field? And they'll come back and say, well, I really like aims one and two, but I thought aim three was a little over ambitious and didn't really fit with the rest. Um, that's the kind of feedback you want early on 
before you write the rest of the proposal, before you commit yourself uh, to writing more. And Rob, I think the template we shared today and this approach helps you avoid procrastination. And uh, one of our colleagues put a very appropriate comment. Procrastination can be an excuse not to write your proposal. And Rob, you know better than anyone else, if you don't submit, your chance of being funded is a big fat zero. So use this kind of approach to help you move ahead efficiently. And again, there's it's an art form. It's not a science. Uh, I'm sure you may have access to other uh, grant writing programs or other strategies for writing a specific games page. But doing this one page early on really helps you sort out if you're ready to move forward or you need a collaborator or you, you need to talk with a program officer and make sure they're interested in what you're doing. Before you spend time running the, writing the rest of the proposal, make sure you're talking to the funder agency and that's your program officer whether it's NIH or a foundation or a professional association or a pilot grant at your respective institution. But um, I agree with you, Rob, these well-written specific aims are the key to a successful proposal. Yeah. And, and this is a skill. Yeah, takes that, practice. I mean, we're illustrating here how it's used in an NIH application, mm -hmm. but the ability to put your ideas in a single page is professionally probably one of the most useful communication skills that you can use. And doesn't necessarily, doesn't always, you know, if you're writing a business plan, if you're a clinician and you wanna propose a new service line to your division chief, a one page proposal, I mean, is a perfect mechanism. I want to present something to my dean. You know, I write one page proposals. You know, go, you know, and it's basically the same structure. It's that narrative that you're talking about. And you're bringing the reviewer to the end of a successful story.